start off my sermon this morning by talking about vampires. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to talk about a person who talks about vampires. And that's Anne Rice, who's written a lot of books, especially in her about vampires, especially in her series called The Vampire Chronicles, that began with her best-selling book in 1976, entitled Interview with a Vampire. And you might remember it was made into a movie starring Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise. During those years that she was writing all those vampire books, she was an atheist. And then, in 1998, she converted back to Christianity, to her Catholicism. She wrote all about this transformation, this conversion, to back to her Christian faith in her memoir entitled, Called Out of Darkness, A Spiritual Confession. And after that, she started writing Christian books. She wrote a lot of several uh, historical fiction on the life of Jesus, a series called Christ the Lord, uh, which, which, was, which, was, which are very good. I've not read any of the vampires. I'm not, <laughs> not into vampires. But I have read a Christian stuff and, and this memoir. In fact, our, at the church that I served out in western Pennsylvania, we had a Christian book club that every, every, every other month we would pick a book and we would we read several of her Christian, Christian books. Then in 2010, she did another U-turn with a very public rejection of Christianity. Why did she leave the church? This is what I want to quote for you today. At that time, she wrote on Facebook. She said, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always but not to being a Christian or being part of Christianity. She goes on, explains, I refuse to be anti-feminist, I refuse to be anti-artificial birth control, I refuse to be anti-democrat, I refuse to be anti-secular humanism, I refuse to be anti-science, I refuse to be anti-life. In the name of Christ, I quit Christianity and being a Christian. Amen, she says. <laughs> I begin my sermon today by quoting this by Anne Rice because her journey is echoed in a lot of other people's spiritual journey. A lot of people have left the church. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about our church here, the sandwich. I'm talking about the church in general, the church with a capital C. People don't go to church the way they used to. I'm reading a book now by Diana Butler Bass entitled Christianity after religion, the end of church, and the birth of a new spiritual awakening. And in that book, she unpacks a lot of data from surveys and studies in the last few decades, and she explores what we in the church already know, we've known for a long time, that Christianity is declining in America. It was just mainline Protestants that were losing members. But in the last 10 years, it has spread to conservative and evangelical churches. You know, a few decades ago, it was popular to observe that the liberal churches were declining, but the conservative churches were growing. In fact, Dean Kelly wrote a very influential book back in 1972 entitled Why Conservative Churches Are Growing, A Study in Sociology of Religion. Well, that is no longer the case. He could not write that book today. Evangelical churches conservative churches, even mega churches, are losing people. Even the mammoth Southern Baptist Convention that always prided itself on growing and growing every year for the last 10 years has seen decline in membership and in attendance in baptisms. This decline has been picking up speed in this century. All the studies that have been shown show that the younger you are, the less likely you are to be part of any church. And we see this in, in, in kids and what, what they know about religion and what they don't know. It's amazing how, how little a lot of kids know because they, they have not been brought up in the church and their parents have not even have been brought up in the church. Um, I'll tell you a story about a uh, uh, pair of twins. They were, they were uh, they're, they're in first grade now. This, this is the kids of Andy George. I don't know if you remember Anne and, Anne and, uh, and Arthur George. They had three kids, and their kids were part of the 
Sunday school here, and they were part of the youth fellowship here. You know, well, Andy got married to Julie, and they have twin girls named uh, Maggie and Hannah. And this, this Easter, she, she said this, and Julie put it on Facebook. What? She said, this, this is what Maggie said. I prayed to the Easter Bunny. Just that's bad enough, you know. <laughs> I prayed to the Easter Bunny to ask him not to bring Hannah an Easter basket. <laughs> you know, oh, this is what we were trying to raise our kids right, you know, to come up with something, something like this. You know, um, the fact is, in our society, as old, the older generation is dying, so are the churches. I look at the churches that I have served over my 40 years of ministry, and I see it. Let's just take, for example, our church here in Sandwich, and let's take the Methodist Church down in Boat World that I've come familiar with because we've been attending there since, since last summer. Back in the 1980s and the 1990s, both churches had building programs because the Sunday schools were growing. We had so many kids, both these churches did, that had no space to put the kids put the kids. I mean, we had the balcony broken into two different sections for two different classes. We had three classes down the fellowship hall that was set up with uh, these, these uh, dividers. So we felt like we had to have space for these kids for Sunday school. So we put a lot of money and time into raising all this money, and raising up, literally, the Baptist meeting house, and putting all this space, Sunday school space, and office space underneath. Now, the Moreau Methodist Church, at the same time, was doing the same thing. You might remember when uh, that Methodist church in Moultonboro at the corner there was just a little tiny roadside chapel. But now it has this beautiful educational building and beautiful fellowship hall in it. Now, both of these congregations have only a handful of kids. These local churches that we know about are not unique. The story is repeated in every town in the country, and especially here in New England where the decline is the sharpest. The South hasn't yet caught up, you know. The South is still living in the past in a lot of ways, but even they are seeing declines. The handwriting is on the wall. People do not go to church the way they used to. We know that from our own personal lives, that our family members <coughs> and friends and neighbors do not go to church the way they used to. Even Christmas and Easter is not what they used to be in the churches anymore. Now, if you ask people why they don't go to church, there'll be a lot of different reasons that they, they will give. Today, I want to give some reasons to go to church. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir, literally. <laughs> <laughs> you are here. You're in church, and I'm telling you why you should go to church. But I'm going to preach this anyway. And uh, I'm going to make it personal why I go to church. I love church. And I'm not exaggerating to say it is the highlight of my week. Psalm 84 that we started off our worship service with. says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. There is a contemporary Christian chorus based on this psalm that says, Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I look forward to church all week. And I am disappointed <coughs> when the worship service does not meet my high expectations. That happened on Easter Sunday when we were down in Daytona. We, were, we, we spent Easter in Daytona Beach. And first of all, I wanted to have sunrise service on the beach. I thought, how wonderful would that be? I couldn't find any February service outside, there's one, there were one inside. I don't want to be inside. I'm sorry, I want to be up on Broy Hill. That's where I want to be. I used to, used to send by. But anyway, couldn't find that. We did find a, a church to go on, on Easter, Easter Sunday. They had two services, 9 and 11. 9 was the traditional, so we went to the traditional service. And I just was disappointed. I'll tell you. That. Uh, I was disappointed by the preaching that I thought was dull, and I was disappointed with the, with the, with the attitude. But they decided to use Easter, it was a big church by the way, it was a, the service we went to probably had about 600 people there, and 
had another living car service. I don't know how many were there. Contemporary. They probably had just as many. So say at least a thousand people were go, going, going to this church. But they decided to use Easter Sunday as a time to kick off a, a program to, uh, to, make, to get new members. So they divided the whole congregation into four different parts, pointed to colors, they each had their own cheerleader. They passed out little brochures that you're supposed to give to people to invite them to a picnic that was coming up in a couple of weeks. And I'm saying, this is about Easter. This is about the resurrection of Jesus, you know? This is not about filling the pews, you know? This is something, you know, anyway. So I, I was not real happy on Easter Sunday in Daytona Beach. Uh, today I want to give five, what I think are five good reasons to go to church. Uh, this is going to be, be brief. First, God. Christ. Truth, meaning, purpose, ultimate reality, whatever word that you feel comfortable with to describe the divine. I use the word God, but when I try to define God, then I, I, I realize I can't. Any, any definition would not be God. I attend church primarily for spiritual reasons. I hunger and thirst for the presence of God. And I find that presence of God in church. Ever since I was a young teen, the quest to experience and to know what is really real, what is truly true in the universe, has been my driving passion. And I have found that in Christ, in God, and in the Spirit, and the church has been the vessel to which I have experienced God most reliably. Now, a lot of people will say that they can experience God on their own, and they don't need church. They say they can be spiritual without organized religion. And apparently, people are increasingly, more and more people, are opting for that path. But when I personally try to be spiritual, Without being religious, I get off track. I get wrapped up in a lot of non-spiritual junk going on in my life, my, my life. As imperfect as the church is, for me, it is a necessary part of my spiritual pilgrimage. That is when, when I was looking for a new church after I retired from here, and I thought it was inappropriate for me to attend here as a previous pastor. I started looking for another church, and I persisted week after week, month after month, going to countless churches in the area. I suffered through a lot of bad sermons. <laughs> a lot of bad theology. A lot of bad music. And I understood right then why people do not go to church. <laughs> but I went every Sunday for a year until I found one that was able to connect me to God and Christ in a meaningful and intellectually satisfying manner. The experience of the living presence of the eternal God is the primary reason I go to church. Second, I go for community. I go for you. I go for people. When two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, there I am in the midst of them. It's not enough to be individually spiritual. True spirituality is not just feeling close to God when walking in the woods or sitting by the lake or reading a spiritual book or listening to a spiritual teaching on YouTube or on a Christian radio station. True spirituality is a community experience. We are social beings. We cannot grow spiritually without a spiritual community. We are deceiving ourselves if we think we can. The Bible says that God is love. You can't love without people. You can't grow in love without trying to love people. Love is about other people. It's not just a general love of humankind. It's a nitty-gritty, painful love of dealing with people that sometimes you can't stand to be around. <laughs> that person on the church board or committee just rubs you the wrong way. The person that has theological beliefs or political views that you don't like. Loving that person is what the church is all about. It's what true Christian spirituality is all about. Not something general. General love. Charles Schultz, the creator of the comic strip Peanuts, famously wrote this line for his cartoon character, Linus. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> Jesus 
taught us to love people. He taught us to love our neighbor. It's the second greatest commandment, he said, next to loving God. The Apostle John says you can't truly love God without loving your neighbor. Church is where we learn to do that. John says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. But he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Jesus even challenged us to love our enemies, which is a revolutionary teaching. That is the highest and most selfless <coughs> spiritual love. That is the goal of the Christian love, to be able to get to that point in our lives. And loving our Christian brothers and sisters is how we practice. How we practice to love other people that we might not like so much. Life in the church grinds the rough edges off of our soul and forms us into the image of Christ, which is what the process called sanctification is all about. This process can be uncomfortable, it can be downright painful at times, but that's the price of spiritual growth. And you can't get that by taking a hike and communing with nature, by watching a sunset or reading a book. You only find that in a community, in church. Third, I go to church for worship. Now this is kind of like my first point about God, but, but here I want to focus on the forms of worship. I love worship services. I love the rhythms of the church calendar that organize my life. I love church music in particular. There's something about live, sacred music that lifts my soul into the presence of God. I couldn't wait this morning to get here and to sing with you when morning yields the skies. My heart waking cries. May Jesus Christ be praised. I love organ music. You know? And that's becoming a lost art to play the organ now. A lot of churches are opting away from organ music and going to electronic music with electric guitars and electronic keyboards and drums. And for many people, that connects them to God, and that is fine. And I like some of it. <laughs> but when I am visiting a church, I have a choice, like I did down in Daytona, between the contemporary and the traditional. I'll get up earlier and I'll go to the traditional service. I, I went to a, a large evangelical church in our area one Sunday. They have a contemporary service where you have to have earplugs to protect your hearing. <laughs> I lasted all of 10 minutes before walking out. I turned to Jews and said, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> I know for many people, they love that. And that brings them into the presence of God. For, that, for them, that is inspiring. And that's fine. It just it works for them. It doesn't work for me. I sure hope they have a traditional music service in heaven. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. If I die, and I wake up in the afterlife, and I hear contemporary Christian music, I'm going to be afraid I land in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> then there's the other parts of worship. Scripture reading, prayer, preaching. For me, good preaching is very important. One of the big reasons I go to a church is, is to hear the Word of God proclaimed. I don't have to always agree with the preacher's interpretation of the Scripture. But it's, it's good if I agree more than mo disagree most, most of the time. But mainly, I want to be challenged intellectually and spiritually and theologically. I want to hear creative, insightful interpretations of Scripture. I want sermons that confront the idolatries of our culture, including the culture of the church. I don't want conventional wisdom. I don't want tired old orthodoxy repeated again and again, or political correctness, or spiritual correctness for that matter. I want preaching that disturbs me and disturbs the principalities and powers of this world in government, in church hierarchies. I want prophetic preaching. I want preaching that questions the sacred cows rather than giving pet answers. Inspiring music, inspiring preaching, inspiring liturgy is why I go to church. Fourth, I go to church to be inspired to act. For me, the, the power behind 
action that the church needs to do is compassion. And I think the church has a great opportunity right now. We have a unique time, a unique moment in time in our society, which I don't think that we've seen since the 1960s and 70s. Maybe it only happens every 50 years or so, but it's happening now. And I'm referring now to the movement that's gaining momentum against gun violence that's being led by the nation's teenagers. We just saw it Friday, you know, for the 19th anniversary of Columbine. I can't believe it's been 19 years since we've allowed crazy people to come up and shoot our children and our teenagers in the schools and nothing having really changed. You know, I'm not seeing the type of passion that I'm seeing in these teenagers since the civil rights movement and the peace movements of the 1960s and 70s. The prophet Isaiah said, and a little child shall lead them. Well, we're being led not by little children, but by teenagers. These teenagers are part from Florida. They've really got it all together, but inspired a whole bunch of teenagers in all these schools across, across the country, including our own, and intellects, those people who are fed up with gun violence. And other youth and other people of other ages are joining in. Like the civil rights movement of 50 years ago, the church can just try to ignore it, pretend it's not going, and continue with business as usual, and be dragged along kicking and screaming, or it can follow the lead of these young people who will no longer tolerate politics as usual. And this is just one example. There are countless more examples of the, what the church must act and speak words of compassion and justice to a culture that is consumed with greed and xenophobia and homophobia, misogyny and racism. I go to church to be challenged in these areas and to be inspired to act fifth and last. I go to church because I can't help it. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm not more spiritual than anybody that doesn't go to church simply because I'm in church every Sunday. I can't help but go. I am incurably religious. Episcopal Bishop John Shelby Spong starts off his book entitled Why Christianity Must Change or Die with these words. He says, I define myself above all other things as a believer. I am indeed a passionate believer. God is the ultimate reality in my life. I live in a constant and almost mystical awareness of the divine presence. I sometimes think of myself as one who breathes the very air of God, or to borrow an image from the East, as one who swims in the infinite depths of the sea of God. Like the psalmist of old, I have the sense of God's inescapableness. I am what I would call a God-intoxicated human being. I resonate with those words. I feel intoxicated by the Spirit under the influence. PWI, preaching while intoxicated. <laughs> PUI, preaching under the influence. I am addicted to God. I have no desire to be cured. I'm not looking for a 12 step program. I could no, song, no longer, no sooner not go to church that I could not breathe or not eat, and I like doing both of those things. <coughs> Some people are addicted to things that are not good, opioids or alcohol or nicotine. I'm addicted to God. Quite honestly, I'm addicted to God's church. The question is, how can we get others hooked on God and hooked on church as a place where they can encounter true God? Early in the sermon, I referred to the book by Diana Butler Bass entitled Christianity After Religion the end of church and the birth of a new spiritual awakening. She thinks we are in the midst of a new spiritual revolution that is breaking apart the old wineskins of traditional Christianity and the so-called institutional church. She thinks that people will increasingly find new expressions for their spirituality apart from the church, and that the church is dying and it needs to change or it will be quite literally the end of the church. The question is, how can we help the church to change? How can we help people to experience what we experience in church? To find God and truth and meaning and purpose in it. To see the value in it. Then the church will have a future. 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who fills us, inspires us, and leads us as, as your church on earth. Lord, we pray that we might be vessels of your Holy Spirit, that people might, might see what is in the lives of your people and, and want that. And they, uh, that we might be contagious Christians, that the power of your Holy Spirit might break forth the forms of the, of the church and might go forth into the world that others might know your love and your grace. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.